And just as the Lord would have it, it ties right into my message today. And, um, you know, just, just as just a thought on what Brother Ed was saying, turn to Job 38. Turn to the book of Job, chapter 38. And um, he was getting me all riled up. I thought he was, he was like punking me on purpose this morning with reading all these commentary notes of, you know, a better translation says, or did, was it actually lice, could it have been gnats, and all the crazy things that these Greek and Hebrew scholars do to get you to disbelieve the Bible, which is why that they say these things, why that they write these things. Um, but in Job chapter 38, look at verses 22 and 23. Has thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or has thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? You know what man makes? Man makes hydrogen bombs and nuclear fission and cold fusion and all these different things. Man makes EMPs and, and, and all of but God uses snow, he uses hail, and those are his weapons. And God takes full responsibility and full credit when you read about the hurricane that kills 20 people or the earthquake that kills these, that's God. Those are his weapons, and that's when you get to the book of Revelation. That's what he's going to be unleashing. God doesn't need a puny little nuclear bomb. You know, 100-pound hailstones dripping with fire and, and uh, dripping with blood and mingled with, with fire. I mean, that makes a nuclear bomb look like a pea shooter when they start falling down from the sky. So I really appreciate the Sunday service this morning. It really, you know, um, this world just tries to constantly steal the credit from the Lord. They don't, they don't want to acknowledge him uh, and, and all those things that you were saying, brother, about uh, uh, those commentators who, well, you know, this didn't really happen and frogs come up at this time of the year. And that is just the world trying to get you to disbelieve this Bible. All right. Um, with that, turn to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And uh, we're going to look at verses 16 and 18 today. And uh, as you're turning there, Lord, we just thank you, God. We praise you for this day, for the people that you have gathered here. And we thank you, Father God, uh, for waking us up today. We thank you for the food on the table, the clothes on our back, and the roof over our head. We're glad, we're grateful to be in church today. Lord, uh, you put this message on my heart. Give me the words to say. Take me out of the way, and you preach it, Lord. And we just commit this time to you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title of my message today is, and this is one you may have heard this title before, On the Last Times, the Antichrist, and the End of the World. Now, if that title sounds familiar to you, that's because it is from a sermon written in 373 AD by a man named Ephraim the Syrian. And all those centuries and millennia ago, he, in 373, got up and he preached a sermon uh, on the last times, the Antichrist, and the end of the world. If you spend five minutes in any church, you will know that one of the most hated Bible doctrines is the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And when I got saved, coming up on 33 years ago, um, tons of people, there were books written about this and movies made about this and everybody talked about the pre-trib rapture, that blessed hope from Titus 2.13, everybody all excited. But over the decades, I have noticed, especially with the advent of social media, uh, people have focused less and less on the pre-trib rapture to the point where now people say, and I'm talking about Christians, not talking about lost people, well, it's been 2,000 years, I'm sure we got it wrong, he's not coming to get us, uh, and the people who don't believe in the pre-trib rapture, which is a Bible doctrine, and I'm going to show you that today, that's not a Baptist interpretation. I'm very glad for the Baptist church shortly after I got saved. It's the first Christian church I was ever a part of, and I've remained a Baptist to some degree over the last 32 years, um, even though I primarily refer to myself as a Bible believer. 
I think that is the proper distinction. I'm a Bible believer who attends a Baptist church, Amen. you know. And one of the good things about the Baptist church is that they have they have been the repository for people who defend the King James Bible. They have been the repository for the people who at least are trying to preach and teach Bible doctrine rightly divided. And um, uh, so we live in a day and age where things that used to be taught and used to be common knowledge are now considered heresy by some and uh, uh, all these different things taking place. And one of the things that people will say is that nobody taught about the pre-trib rapture before John Nelson Darby and Mary McDonald in the early 1800s. And nobody taught about the pre-trib rapture before C.I. Schofield and his Schofield Reference Bible. Nobody taught about the pre-trib rapture except for John Nelson Darby, C.I. Schofield, Clarence Larkin, and Peter Ruckman. That's what people will say. Now, I want to give you, I've never read this sermon by Ephraim the Syrian. You would think that since I'm borrowing the title of his message for my message, that I would have looked up the sermon, but didn't have time for that. But this is the one quote that I found. This is written in 373 AD. For all the saints and elect of God are gathered prior to the tribulation that is to come and are taken to the Lord lest they see the confusion that is to overwhelm the world because of our sins. And that's what that man preached in 373 AD. Now, has anybody ever heard of a little institution called the Roman Catholic Church? This is why Bible doctrine was not preached all through the 400s, the 500s, and it got less and less till it disappeared when we were in school. What did they call that time period from 500 AD to 1500 AD? The Dark Ages. They called it the Dark Ages, and the light of the gospel had gone out. And this is why we look at things like the doctrine of the pre-trib rapture, um, the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church as this new doctrine, because these are some of the things that came out when the Reformation happened. I'm not a Protestant, but they did some good work. The King James Bible is really the Bible of the Reformation. And from that, Bible doctrine began to be taught and to be preached once again. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Actually, we'll go with 15. Yeah, we'll go with 13. Um, 1 Thessalonians 4, it took 13 through 18. Paul says, But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. I've heard people say um, that the Apostle Paul thought he might be taken in the rapture. Well, when you get to 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says the time of my departure is at hand. I don't think that the Apostle Paul, who was taken to the third heaven, I don't think he had any idea at all that he was going to be part of the rapture. But what is he saying here? He says that we which are alive and remain, who is he talking to? Well, here he's talking to the Thessalonians. But who is he talking to? He's talking to the Christian church. Whichever one of you find yourself alive at this time, whenever that time is going to be, these, this is the protocol. These are the things that are going to take place. And just like with what we heard in Sunday school today, and God wrote all these things out in the Old Testament. You know, one of the things that Lori and I were talking about on the ride here this morning, that Israel going through all these problems and wars and rumors of wars, and now they're getting ready to open up a second front with Lebanon and Hezbollah, and they have nothing but trouble over in Israel. All they would have to do, and they could really kind of bypass the New Testament. If Israel would just open up this book and believe what is written in there and realize, hey, when I read the book of Jeremiah, what did, 
What was God's problem with the Jewish people? When I read Ezekiel and Daniel and Amos and Joel, what is God's problem with the Jewish people? Hey, are we doing that today? And then if all they would have to do is just open up this book, read it, and believe what they read, and then they wouldn't look at the New Testament as some strange doctrine. The only reason why the Jewish people don't believe the New Testament is because they don't believe the Old Testament either. And there is no launching point. There is no place to move to. If you don't believe the first thing that God wrote, you're not going to believe the last thing that God wrote. So, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says this, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then, we which are alive, who is that? Whichever born-again, saved, church member, body of Christ that happens to be alive when this event takes place, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Wherefore, Paul says, comfort one another with these words. I don't find anybody comforting anybody with these words. This doctrine of the pre-trib rapture is, I mean, I get shocked sometimes, and I shouldn't. For the last 15 years, I've been doing this ministry called Now the End Begins. It's an end times Bible prophecy ministry, and uh, we started doing a podcast four years ago. In April will be the fourth anniversary of the podcast, and we see these things taking place all day, every day. And we're shouting it from the housetops. And proportionately, we're getting this much of a response. Now, don't get me wrong. We have millions of people who come to the website on a yearly basis. We have tens of thousands of people who listen to our broadcast every single week. But proportionately, you'll have some Elon Musk you know, publish some sort of stupid video about something and 21 million people will watch it. Tucker Carlson, who I personally like, okay, I call him the last truth teller. He's, he's the last one even trying to get the truth out, okay? And he'll do some sort of a thing about politics and um, it will get 100 million views. You talk about the pre-trib rapture of the church. Paul says, hey, are you a Christian? Do you know this doctrine? Comfort one another with these words. And yet, nobody seems to be comforting anybody and ju just arguing about these different things. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. So I want to show you the reason why people argue about the pre-trib rapture of the church and why... I would have to say at this point, the majority of Christians, now I'm not talking about everybody says, well, they didn't really get saved or they're the pretend Christians or they're the Christians in name only. You know, we can't possibly know who's saved and who's not. There's only three people that know if you're saved. You know that you're saved because either you made the transaction or you didn't. Either you gave the Lord your sins in exchange for his righteousness through his shed blood, or you didn't. Well, God knows if you're saved or not. And the devil knows if you're saved or not. So, we can't look out at the world and, and say, well, they don't believe that because they're not saved. But that's, see, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says this, that this would be the hallmark of the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they keep to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on to fables. Now turn to Revelation chapter 3. We live in a day and age where fables are being taught 
and millions upon millions of people are taking these, these words that tickle their... Charles Spurgeon said this shortly before he died, that the time will come instead of the shepherds feeding the sheep, you're going to have clowns entertaining the goats. Now, I have a belief why these things are all happening now, not just because we live in the last days, but because we are so close to these things. We are so close to the pre-tribulation rapture of the church that the devil is raising up lukewarm Christians, unbelievers. Uh, I saw an article on CNN last year, and they, they call it rapture hysteria, talking about far-right Christians who believe that God's going to come down in the sky and pull us out of our situation. I mean, CNN was writing about that. And you know that things are bad when CNN is writing articles to get you to not believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. But either you believe that these things are true or you don't. Either you believe that Jesus is going to come back and get us the way that he said that he would, or you don't believe that. And if you do believe that, then there should be some evidence in your life that, for, for example, before I moved here to St. Augustine in 2011, I had never been in a hurricane. I had been in a tornado. I had been in nor'easters. I had been in a lot of snowstorms and and uh, just absolutely four feet high. I remember the snowstorm of 78, and it was just literally four feet of snow fell in like two days. And they're still talking about that, that storm. But I had never been in a hurricane. And if you remember the hurricane back in 2017, I think it was called Hurricane Matthew. Well, St. Augustine hadn't had a real hurricane making landfall since about 1952. The police weren't taking any special precautions. Uh, nothing was blocked off downtown. I can remember after the rain started coming, and this is going to sound like a made-up story, but I promise you it's the truth. I can remember driving my Jeep down to the fort in downtown St. Augustine, and this was about a day before it was going to make landfall. There was no paramedics, there was no fire department, there was no, there was one lone cop car and they weren't stopping anybody. They didn't have lights flashing, there were no sandbags, there were no orange cones. And I, and I drove my Jeep all the way down to the parking lot of the fort and maybe if this is the bottom of my tire, the water was that high. I mean, I was, I was a little crazy for doing that, even with the Jeep. And I'm down there and I noticed that, what's the name of that street that goes along the bayfront? Right? Avenida Menendez. What's that? Avenida Menendez. Yes. I noticed that the water was really high. And so I went over to the water and I stood in it and it was up to my waist. And I'm looking around, I'm like, where are the first responders? Nobody shutting anything down. The restaurants were still open. There were people who were going to the restaurants by these little boats and canoes, and I thought, this is the strangest thing that I've ever seen in my life, right? And so what did I do? I went to that street, and I dove in the water, and I swam on that road. I, it sounds like I'm making it up, but I swam on Avenida de Menendez, and I swam probably, I don't know, 50 yards, 60 yards until I saw the oil stains, and broken glass, and I thought, this is this is maybe one of the stupidest things that I have ever done in my life. And I quickly got out of the water. I'm like, God, forgive me, that was stupid. I could have cut myself and got some nasty infection. But I did, now that was 2017. That was Hurricane Matthew. Anybody remember the damage that Hurricane Matthew did? Anybody remember how that entire bayfront Every single business was wiped out. And I remember for maybe six months afterwards, and I don't know the name of the business, but they have those green and orange trucks and they do restoration. They're, 
their tagline is like it never happened and they take care of water damage and smoke damage and fire damage and those red and green trucks and those trucks were lined up on that street front and back for six months now why because everybody had the announcement everybody had the warning nobody paid attention nobody cared if you go back and look at the news from that hurricane there was a group of people who got to one of those restaurants i think it was the teeny martini bar or the one next to it and they went there by boat and they got in and finally by this point the police showed up and they said you better come out of there because this water is going to rise and you're going to be stuck there and we're not going in to get you is what they said it was on the news and the water rose and everything starts shorting out everything starts turning off um, and those people were stuck there and they had to spend the night there and I'm sure that they were I don't know if they were terrified it doesn't sound like they were too smart to begin with but they were probably they had a very sleepless anxious time watching that water rise up now if you remember the very next year there was a little hurricane called Her Hurricane Irma. Now, for weeks before she showed up, St. Joseph's Field, you want to come get your sandbags? I can remember making my own sandbag in 2017, stealing sand from the St. Augustine Beach and hoping that the cops weren't going to say something. Uh, and then the very next year, or whenever that second hurricane came, now you had um, resources lined up and bottles of water and cases of water and the orange cones and the sandbags and everybody was prepared for the second one well from a spiritual perspective it's 2017 for us and God is shouting this through anybody who was willing to listen to it anybody who was willing to stand up and say hey this, this I believe what this book says, and these things are about to happen. And the atmosphere is like 2017. Nobody cares. People, they don't want to hear it. They don't have time for it. Everyone has, the pandemic is over, quote unquote. Everybody's gone back to their sports teams. Everybody's gone back to whatever it is that they did before the pandemic. And we are 10 times closer to the realization of these events in 2024 where everybody thinks we are eight weeks into this year our podcast on friday was about a movie that was released on netflix um, on november 22nd of 2023 called leave the world behind it was produced by obama and his production company mm -hmm. and it was about um the end of the world. It was about nuclear war, it was about the American government turning on its own people, which is a very unique type of movie for a former U.S. president to make, but he made that movie, and um, three months to the day that that movie was released, and I'm sure it's just, just a crazy coincidence, three months to the day, we had the largest cell phone outage that we have had almost since cell phones got popular 20 years ago. And what they said, it was a software glitch that brought down AT&T. Just like it was, um, it was the airplane crashes that brought down the Twin Towers and then Building 7 decided to pull itself down in sympathy to the other two buildings that it sat next to. Right? It's like, what brought those buildings? What, what, you can say what you want about the Twin Towers. What brought down building number seven? It was untouched. It wasn't hit by anything. And yet it came down. So in 2023, they released this movie, Leave the World Behind. And three months to the day, the main thing that that movie talked about, which was the disruption of mobile phone service, Three months to the day we had, and this is just Wednesday, okay? We had the largest cell phone disruption, all, I want to say in the history of cell phones, but it's a very short history, okay? <laughs> and these things are taking place around us. They are broadcasting this, they are telegraphing this, and they're still not ahead of what this book 
has to say. Now, Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. I want you to look starting in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold nor hot. You talk to people about Bible versions. Nah. You know, it's just, this is easier to read. This is a word-for-word -word translation from the originals. And I'm like, oh, really? You have the originals that you can compare that to? <coughs> well, no, but some guy said that, that this is a word-for-word. -word. This is the best possible trend. Nobody cares. We live in a day and age. People aren't hot. People aren't cold. They're just right there in the middle, and they're lukewarm. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And now he says this, keeping in mind that in Revelation 13, you're going to have the mark of the beast, which the whole purpose of the mark of the beast is to control buying and selling. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, Tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. And then he gives the invitation. This is not an invitation to salvation. He's already talking to saved people. This is addressed to the Laodicean church. Have you ever read in the book of Colossians where Paul talks about the letter that he wrote to the Laodicean church? And the letter that he wrote from the Laodicean church to the Colossians? You won't find it in the Bible, but Paul talks about it in the book of Colossians. So the people that are being addressed here in Revelation chapter 3 are not unsaved people. They're not fake Christians. They're not people who had a, a emotional response to the gospel and they have head knowledge and no heart knowledge and all the other things that people say, the people that are being spoken to in Revelation chapter 3 are born again, saved, blood washed, blood bought Christians who, when the rapture takes place, these people going up with everybody else. And John is writing here and he says, um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that he fought a good fight. What was Paul fighting against? Well, he was fighting against the world, the Romans, false brethren. Uh, he was fighting against the flesh, Romans chapter 7. He was, he was fighting against the devil. That was the fight that Paul had when he said, I fought the good fight. It's the, it's the world, the flesh, and the devil. But what are Christians being called to overcome here in Revelation chapter 3? I know we said that we would take questions at the end, but does anybody have an idea what is in view here? What is John calling us to overcome? It's not your flesh, it's not the world, it's not the devil. Deception? <laughs> well, that is a that is a a piece of it, absolutely. What's in the context here? This is a letter that is addressed to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, a church that Paul has already put his stamp on in the book of Colossians. These are real Born again believers. And this is the message from the Lord. And it's a hard message. It's a hard message. And I've I've preached this before and I've gotten some blowback from some pastors. How dare you say that? I'm like, well, because God said it. I'm just repeating it. You ready? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is not the door to your heart. This is the church door. <laughs> The church door. 
Because this is a letter addressed to the Laodicean church. He's, on, he's, he's outside the church door, and he's knocking. Why is Jesus on the outside of the church? Well, I already gave that to you in 2 Timothy chapter 4. For the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. Uh, and what does it say? Keep your finger here in Revelation 3 and turn to Acts chapter 20. Brother Ed was there earlier. Um, Acts chapter 20. And look down at the bottom of the passage. And what does Paul say? Verse 29. I think Brother Ed even touched on this this morning. For I know this, that after my departing shall, that's 2 Timothy chapter 4, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock, and of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw them away, disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember. Paul's reminding them, hey, by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Now go back to Revelation chapter 3. Verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, talking to people inside the church, and open the door, let me in. Now, Jesus, he's not saying I'm going to come and bring revival. He's not saying that I'm going to come and this is a church that has gone absolutely apostate. You're not hot. You're not cold. You're lukewarm, which is disgusting. I'm going to spit you out at the judgment seat of Christ. You're not going to get crowns. You're not going to get rewards. You're burning the whole thing up down here. He says, but if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me to him that overcometh. The Laodicean spirit of the church. Amen. That's what's in view. The church has gone not hot, not cold. The church has gone indifferent. And of course, I didn't read the passages where it says you are rich and increased with goods and you think you have need of nothing. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried <laughs> in, in the uh, fire. And you get to the book of James. And what does James say? Weep and howl, ye rich men, for your, you have heaped up treasures for the last times, and your, your, your gold is cankered, right? Because they've all taken the mark of the beast. But how do you get to that point? So here in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. We are called as Christians in these last days to make a decision. Are we going to be like the people from Hurricane Matthew? Or are we going to be like the people in Hurricane Irma who were ready who believed the reports of what was going to take place and took preparations, as the Bible would say, against that day. And Jesus says in Matthew, and the rains came and the winds blew, but the house stood because it was founded upon a rock. And so the title of my message today is The Last Times, The Coming Antichrist, and The End of the World. If you were to ask the average Christian about the end times, they, you would likely hear some sort of an answer where they would put together, if they believe the rapture, but they would put together the tribulation with Armageddon, with the second advent, with, with the battle of Gog and Magog, and they would put all those things together. But all those things don't belong together. You have the rapture of the church. You have the start of the time of Jacob's trouble. And then you have all the things that take place in the second half of Jacob's trouble. You have the great tribulation. Then you have the battle of Armageddon. Then you have the second coming where he returns with his bride. Then you have the thousand year reign. Then you have the battle of Gog and Magog. Then you have the great white throne judgment. And then you have the end of the world. 
But the vast majority of Christians don't know this. They think it's all one kind of homogenous lump and all these things are just going to take place. Now, some of these things take place rapid fire, but some of them don't. And so if the rapture was to take place right now, there would be at least a minimum of a thousand and seven years before the world actually came to an end. That's how much time that would go by. And so we live in a day and age where Christians don't care about these things. They don't rightly divide. They don't want to be taught about these things. They simply want to be left alone to their lukewarm, middle-of-the-road status. And what does Paul say? He says, look, Timothy, I'm going to give you a charge. Now, to me, Timothy represents the church. He is, he was the handpicked son in the faith of the Apostle Paul, and he was his, largely his successor, and he wrote 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and he, he tells you this is how churches are, need to be set up, and this is how things have to go, and, you know, this is what you have to do, and he, he tells him You've got to stand in the gap, not be, yes, between lost people and hell. Absolutely. Um, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But the charge to Timothy is to stand in the gap between born again saved Christians and the judgment seat of Christ and them blowing everything. Now, I believe this in Ephesians chapter, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. This is another thing that I, I teach on that makes people mad. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 through 14. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that... We should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, and in these verses God is dismantling Calvinism, um, uh, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest or down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, I believe that when a person trusts Christ and they make what I call the great exchange, they take their sin, they know that they're a sinner, and they know that Jesus went to the cross. Acts 20, 28 said that he shed God's blood on the cross. And he makes... The sinner makes that great exchange. I made that exchange almost 33 years ago. I didn't have a, a Christian advising me, telling me what to do. I had never set foot inside a Christian church, Baptist or otherwise, and I didn't know anything about being a Christian. All I had was John 3.16, and I understood that God went to the cross and he paid for my pardon which that night all by myself, people say, well, the sinner's prayer doesn't do much. Well, it does if, if, if that's the intent of your heart as you're making the exchange. And I did that that night and I trusted Jesus Christ as my savior. And I would love to be able to say that it was all nothing but good times. And, you know, I've stayed strong these past 33 years, but that's not the, I've had my ups and downs. I've had my seasons of being backslidden, you know, and, and, and through it all, even at my lowest moments and my worst moments, I was always aware that God saved me. Amen. And that gave me the ability to dust myself off <laughs> and crawl out of whatever pit I had put myself back in and say, okay, Lord, forgive me for that. And I put it under the blood. And uh, I ask you, Father God, to get me back on a right footing. And God does that. Um, I forget who said it, but I think it, 
I don't remember who said this, but somebody years ago said that when they really understand God's grace and God's mercy, that even their repenting needs to be repented of. And when you realize how unworthy that we are and how easily any of us and given a long enough arc, all of us will fall away to some degree. But the question is, the question is, do you care about these things? Do you prioritize these things? Now, everybody who's sitting here today could be someplace else. And they've chosen to be here for the preaching. They chose to be here for the Sunday school. You know where revival comes from? Revival comes from when people get excited about the word of God. Not about musical programs. Not about good singers and anything like that. It's about when people get excited about what this book has to say. And they say, God, let me incorporate as much of this into my life as you will allow me to have. And God likes to move slow. God likes to move by degrees. God's not in a rush. We live in time. Uh, Brother Ed was saying th this, this morning that on a Wednesday night, sometimes you'll get people who haven't been there for 10 years. And the only reason why they're back is because they're in trouble of some kind whether it's health, whether it's financial, whether it's whatever it happens to be. But you know what the amazing thing about God is? The amazing thing about God is he'll let you come back, right? Have you ever had a relationship with somebody that so thoroughly hurt you or aggravated you or betrayed you that you not only didn't want to forgive them, but you didn't forgive them? And I know people who have gone to their, Christians who have gone to their death with unresolved conflict that they had with other Christians, and they knew that they were dying, and they didn't want to reach out and say, hey brother, hey sister, forgive me for that, I forgive you, let's make it, I'm getting ready to go home to be with the Lord. And one reason for that is, is that we live in the Laodicean church age. I have a good friend, um, his name is Craig, and uh, he has been a huge supporter of the work that we do with Now the End Begins, and he comes to the camp meeting, and, and, and uh, I speak with him on the phone maybe about once a week, sometimes twice a week. And um, at the height of the pandemic, we came to the conclusion that if the Lord tarries long enough, just about everybody, me, you, every single one of us are going to fall into some sort of apostasy, heresy. Uh, can you imagine what it would be like to wake up one day and not believe that the King James Bible was the preserved word of God? No. Now you say to yourself, well, that would never happen to me. But I know people that it has happened to. And they woke up as it was from a dream. And why did I ever believe that? Why did I ever think that that was true? The majority of the Christians that I know don't get excited about Bible doctrine. And that's the thing that Paul said would be missing in the last days. He said, Timothy, church, you got to preach that word. And Paul knew about Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 20. Paul knew about that, okay? He had already been up there. He wasn't allowed to talk about it. He already saw everything that John saw. And Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, look, you got to prepare yourself. you got to prepare the church. you got to shout it from the housetops because the hurricane is coming. And you've got to get the sandbags. you got to get the orange cones. you got to get the supply of food. You know, the number one thing that I had never thought about with a hurricane, and it just never dawned on me because I had never been through it, is not having power. You know what it means when you don't have power? All the food in the refrigerator and freezer goes bad. Worst part is, you can't make coffee. <laughs> right? That's, that's the worst part. And then, the power doesn't come back for 48 hours, three days, a week. Last hurricane that we had, the power was not on. We used to live in Palencia. The power wasn't on for 10 days. 
And I, I felt like I was living in a third world country, right? People weren't prepared. The town didn't take the preparations and everybody paid the price. There's that movie from the 90s or maybe even the 80s, The Terminator. And there's that great scene from The Terminator where they say, if you can hear this, you're the resistance. Every single person sitting in this room today are the resistance. We are the ones that have been called to stand in the gap and preach the doctrine of the last days to born-again Christians who no longer care, who no longer want to talk about it, who no longer want to be engaged. What does it say in Ezekiel chapter 3? And I'll just paraphrase it. Um, Ezekiel, God says to him that you set up watchmen over Israel and you tell them to blow the trumpet when they see the enemy coming. Now, if you don't blow the trumpet and these people get taken out, their blood I require at your hands because you knew you were the watchman. But if you set up a standard, you blow that trumpet and you tell those people what's coming and they choose not to listen, then your conscience is clean. You did what you were supposed to do. Each and every one of us, on Wednesday night, I, I talked about what I believe. What I believe more strongly than just about anything else outside of the doctrines of salvation, I believe that we are living in the last days. And I believe that we are watching the world prepare itself Actively, I'm not talking from a high-level perspective. I'm not talking from a, a theoretical perspective. I am talking that every single day where I watch the news, somebody once said, if you, if you don't watch the news, you are uninformed, but if you do watch the news, you're misinformed. <laughs> right? Right? But this book, right? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I believe more strongly than anything else that we are living in the last days. I believe that the spirit of... Ant now, John said that there are many antichrists in the world and that has existed. That, that's how you account for all this garbage that's gone on for 2,000 plus years. But in 2020, I believe that the Lord told me that the active, actual spirit of Antichrist was released in this world. And now, you might say, okay, you're watching people die of COVID, all this hysteria, we're being locked down, they're trying to make us wear masks and all this crazy stuff. Maybe you just got a little bit too excited and when you wrote that article, that was four years ago now. That article is more true in 2024 than it was when I wrote it in 2020. And I believe that this world is preparing itself to actively receive Antichrist and that we are getting ready to get out of here very, very quickly. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to go out lukewarm. And I don't want to go out cold. I want to go out at just the right temperature that the Lord wants me to be at. Amen. And Paul said that he finished his course. I've taught on that for a decade. And every time that I teach on Paul finishing his course, somebody writes me an email and says, what's a course? I don't have one. I've never had one. If you don't have a course, if you're saved for longer than a week, and you don't have a course that you're aware of, there's something wrong. Because, because that is, just like you go to grade school, high school, college, whatever it is that you go to, there is coursework that needs to be done for graduation. And there is coursework that we need to have done if you want that crown, whatever those crowns, whatever they look like, I don't know. All I know is that I want to when that trumpet, what was that song that we sang? When the roll is called, when the roll is called up yonder. We don't know when we're going to get that call. 
but whenever that call comes, I want to go out at full speed. And in order for me to do that, I got to do four things and then I'm done really super quick. I got to fight the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's what I have to do. I also have to fight the lukewarm Laodicean spirit of this age where other Christians telling me, just take it easy, just calm down, just relax, everything's going to be fine. Everything is not going to be fine. This world is getting ready for a uh, Job 38 storm, and this world is not prepared. The vast majority of Christians are not prepared. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for these people that you've gathered here, Lord. If there's one here this morning, God, who doesn't know you as Savior, um, Lord, we just pray that something was said and done that would lead that lost soul to you. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, just slip up your hand and I'll be very happy to talk with you. I can't imagine that everybody here is not saved, but it happens. It absolutely happens. And uh, there is nothing more important in this life than knowing where you go when you die. And uh, if you are saved, I want you to think about what was preached this morning. I want you to think about what your course is. If I handed you a piece of paper and a pen and I said, okay, great, you have a course. Could you just write it down and show it to me so I can understand what your course is? Can you do that? If you can't do that, there is something wrong. You need to be able to do that. Everybody, from the moment that you were saved, has been given a course of something that God wants you to accomplish. God gives everybody different talents and abilities. That is absolutely true. We are not all called to do the same thing, but we are all called to do something. And it is my prayer this morning that we will not be like St. Augustine 2017, where nobody taking preparations, the floodwaters rising, and nobody warning anybody else about the danger that lurks in the floodwater. Let us be like the 2018 town, where well before the event takes place, we are warning and waiting and watching and encouraging people and opening up this word and uh, preaching it from the housetops and seeing people get saved and saved people getting back on fire for God. And Lord, uh, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing me to be in the pulpit this morning, Lord. Thank you for your word. And uh, Father God, as we go out this morning, just be with us and let a little fire be lit this morning, God. Just a spark, just an ember, uh, just a little flame, God. Uh, let a spark be lit today. And uh, we just put it in your hands for the increase, God. And we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Because uh, we don't know who is saved. You know.